Okay, good morning. You're all in. We got there. Takes a while, doesn't it? But it's really good to see you all back in here. Um, I've not actually been with you for like two years now. It was Trinity Sunday and the following week, back in 2019, the last time that I, was, uh, I led you in worship. Much has changed, clearly, but so good to be back with you this morning. Um, there's no official intimations, but first of all, the eagle eye amongst you would have spotted that it's not the 11th, it's the 18th today. That's the deliberate mistake to make sure that you guys are all switched on. Thanks, Douglas. <laughs> and you'll also notice that I'm not Sonia, okay? So my name's Stuart, Stuart Finlayson. If you don't know who I am, I am, well, I'm still a candidate, but as of the 1st of June, I will be probationer minister through in, in Elgin. St. Giles and St. Columbus South. Uh, a few things to say quickly, keep your masks on, don't get up, don't, get, don't wander about, clearly. Uh, but I did want to uh, make you aware that obviously the government changes have been that you can now gather in groups of six from six different households. So if you did choose when you got outside to have a chat to each other then you know, that would be nice, that would be fine, but it's up to you, absolutely. Um, I've got a few things that I'd like to share with you, a bit different today. Got the screen up, okay? So, uh, next one. Call to worship. This is particularly interesting for those who can't get to church for whatever reason. Myself, uh, Dion and Sonia have set this up now. So you can call that local telephone number don't worry, you don't have to write it down yet, I can hand it out later. And you'll get a 10 minute short reflection over the telephone, over the landline, if that's how you're more inclined to, to um, well, just to connect with the church and what we're doing, okay? There's also another thing I want to show you. Uh, you might not see it because it's quite light. Um, I've been hosting a thing called Dwelling in the Word for, well, best part of a year now, it all came out of the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic, and it's a contemplative prayer practice where we listen to scripture read, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us in what we listen to and what we hear. So this is going to start again very soon, so when it does, I'll make sure that you have the details, because it might be something, it's quite different, but it might be something that some of you might like to try. And that's really it for what I've got to say to begin with, but on your order of service sheets you'll see that our first praise is, as we are gathered, Jesus is here. And uh, Alistair's going to play that twice for us now, so let's just sit and reflect on the presence of God amongst us this morning, as we are gathered.
So you'll have noticed on your order of service this morning that we're going to try something a little bit different. We're going to read together a psalm, Psalm 4, on your order of service. You will see it. Please join in um, as we say the words to Psalm 4 together. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let, me light, let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. We have come here today to worship you, to sit here together as part of the communion of Jesus Christ, to reflect on you and to feel your presence, to listen to your word and with our hearts sing the songs of praises that are yours alone. Father, you are the creator of life from eternity past to our present and into eternity future. You brought us out of the earth and into the world in your own image. You breathed life into us, the breath of life which came from within you. Brother, you are the only righteous son in whose likeness we will be made new. You came among us and taught us the error of our earthly ways and gave your life to our sin so that we might live. Comforter, you are the Spirit, guiding our lives with hope and assurance. You fill this space around us with light and life and love. You are with us in every moment of the day, encouraging us, speaking to us, and upholding us. Lord God Almighty, receive our worship and reclaim us now for your service. Set us free to honour you today as we so rightly should, because you are the Eternal One, the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end. Lord, in your presence we acknowledge our place in a failing world. We pray that in mercy you show to us the sin in our life so that we can repent of our ways and by your grace be brought back into fellowship with you. We have done wrong. We have followed the earthly desires of the heart and made ourselves like idols ahead of you. We cry out for the promise of what you have planned for us all along that we could know you and walk with you all the days of our lives. So we ask in humility 
and adoring silence. And for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, forgive all that is past and lead us out from the darkness to walk as children of light. Father, we commit this time to you in the gift of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his followers to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, a few weeks after the, the beginning of the first lockdown back in March 2020, it became really obvious that our regular patterns of worship weren't going to uh, sustain, they weren't going to continue for a while. So I, uh, myself and my, my kids set about creating some, some uh, worship content. Uh, we called it the Sunday Club and we sent it out to uh, the, 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 the presbytery, sorry, the presbytery and offered it to any, any young people that would so like to, uh, to use it. Uh, and I thought it might be nice for you to see some of that. So I'm just gonna turn up some volume. The Sunday Club. Sunday Club. Say hi, Larry. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Um, okay, so today we are uh, in church. We are going to be reading from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49, and that is when Jesus appears to the disciples. But uh, I'd like to go back a few verses to the road uh, to Emmaus, where two of the followers and friends of Jesus were, well, they were a little bit fed up and they didn't know what to expect anymore. They're the man that they had followed, that they thought was going to save Israel, the Jewish nation from the Romans, hadn't, um, well, he'd been killed. And what happens next? They didn't know. They were a bit sort of sad. So we'll do a little experiment. I think you'll enjoy this. You can, you'll definitely enjoy this. Let me get things sorted out. So, Show everyone our picture, Larry. We've got Jesus. Just push it out towards us so we can see it. There we are. Right, so there's Jesus. There's Jesus, okay? He's got his, uh, he's got his, uh, his cloak on and things. Um, so what happened was, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus um, came to be with his followers and yep. came to be with the followers and they didn't recognise him. They didn't recognise him at all, and they walked all the law, all the way along the road with him. They 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 even asked him to come and stay with them overnight because it was getting late. So he sat down with them. He had a meal with them, and it wasn't until the last minute when Jesus takes the bread, gives thanks, broke it, that they recognised it was Jesus. So for the whole journey, they didn't know it was him until the very last minute. So hopefully this little experiment is going to show us, or is going to explain what happened. So we've got our picture of Jesus, haven't we? So Jesus here. Okay, so he's gone on his walk. He's with the, his friends Bye. all the way along, and they have something to eat in the evening. They break bread. He breaks the bread. Pop it in. And look what happens. They see that it is Jesus. How cool is that? <laughs> Just as just as quickly as they recognise him, wow. he disappears. So would you like to make one of these cool little pictures, yeah? Yeah. Do you want to make one? Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's make something. So Larry's doing her 
picture now. What are you drawing, Larry? A ladybird. Right, so you're gonna do the body on one side. You're gonna do the body on one side of a, a double piece of um, kitchen paper. So and on the other side, I'm gonna do the head and the legs. Okay, so this is like, um, like a card, like a birthday card, okay? And on the front, we draw some of it, some of the picture, and then on the inside of the card, we, do the we draw the rest, but we have to put some marks onto here. Yeah, like a dot, the dot, right, the dot, the dot. We know dot, that dot, that's dot. where the picture is. Okay, we know that's where the picture is. Right so draw the head. And then the legs. And then the legs. And draw the head. A smaller circle and two eyes and a smile. And I'll draw the legs right here. Well done. That Brilliant. looks more like a spider, but whatever. Well, no, spiders have <laughs> spiders have got eight legs, haven't they? That's got yeah. six, so that's good. Right, so fold it over. The front, this bit's supposed to be red, so okay. I'm not gonna care about that. Okay, right, so take your ladybird and drop her in the water. Yay, look, <laughs> the legs and the head. <laughs> that is so cool, isn't it? Do you like doing that? That's really good. Can we do it again? Do it again? Yeah. yeah. We'll what have again. you drawn on the front of your paper? A caterpillar. Ca a caterpillar, right. Now, pop it into the dish, see what happens. <gasps> oh, the caterpillar's turned into a butterfly. It's the wrong way around. Oh dear, <laughs> never mind. That's my fault because I drew the antenna on. Never mind. We hope that you enjoyed doing that little experiment and that you learned a little bit more about Jesus uh, appearing to his friends on the road to yeah. Emmaus and where can we're going to put all the all this Stuff. where are we going to put it we're going to put on the link below on the link below okay so below here on the YouTube channel you'll find the link that will give you the instructions for what to do okay bye. say bye bye hope you liked it <laughs>
Our scripture reading this morning, you'll find it in your order of service, is from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49, uh, and it's titled, Jesus Appears to the Disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Amen. And may God add his blessing to our understanding. We're now going to have a moment of music for reflection. Thank you, Alistair. So, last week, Sonia preached to us from John's Gospel when Jesus appears to Thomas. Excuse me. The first thing I'd like to say about that is what an unfortunate name for that man. I mean, doubting Thomas most certainly was. In fact, that 
well, the fact that he demanded that Jesus come back and show him the marks uh, of his death, lest he never actually believe the claims of the other disciples that he was in fact alive, was one thing. You know, Thomas wanted the hard evidence before he was going to truly believe. Personally, now this is just me, I feel that his new handle is a bit harsh because, well, the entire history of Israel, everything that has been written about the history and the character of the nation is, it's of a people who consistently doubted the authority, the sovereignty, and the absolute power of God, of Yahweh. When we look at scripture, we see that Israel doesn't have a good track record. In fact, even before Israel became a nation, humanity itself, well, we were having problems. When we look at the very beginning, or the Genesis, we find that the people whom God had created to live alongside him in delight, um, well, they'd rebelled and chose their own path. We know this. From that moment on, our relationship with God was very, very different, and the prophetic sequence began to play out in history. So perhaps giving Thomas this name wasn't really all that fair. Nonetheless, it has stuck with him over many, many years. But the fact is that Thomas, well, he did doubt the resurrection, and as such, he's been, well, he's been maligned ever since. And which is very, very strange because this guy spent the best part of three years traveling with the Lord Jesus, listening to all that he had to say, all that he taught them, all the working they did, they walked their journey together. So it seems that there are those who can walk in the presence of the Lord and still not recognize him. If we go back a bit in the Easter story, uh, we spoke about it today at the Sunday Club, that uh, on, the road to, uh, on the road to Emmaus, the two people who were walking the road were joined by Jesus and still they didn't recognize him. They walked and they talked and they listened to him. They even persuaded him to stay the night. But it wasn't until he shared a meal with them that in the breaking of the bread, that symbol of his death, that they recognized him for who he was. It's after the meeting on the road to the Emmaus that today's passage comes in comes into play. Uh, it's probably a good idea to remember actually that although we are in the third Sunday after Easter, the narrative is, is very much still rooted on Resurrection Sunday. The third Sunday witnesses to the third appearance that Jesus makes to his disciples. And the beginning of the passage is very similar, very similar indeed to what we heard John say last week. Both men tell us that Jesus appears to them in the same upper room where they celebrated the Passover, the Passover meal together and where Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper just a few days earlier. This space, the upper room, is still the sanctuary, the safe place for the disciples as they hide from the watchful eyes of religious leaders and Roman authorities. And they're very likely to still feel anxious, concerned, worried about what's going on around them. But both times Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. Shalom, as it would have sounded to them, isn't just a type of peace that comes from being physically safe behind locked doors. It's much, much greater than that. It's the peace that in John 14, Jesus had promised to leave his followers once he was no longer with them. 
There Jesus explains the way to the Father and that everything he says comes from the Father. He tells the disciples that the authority is not his own. It comes from the Father. And most importantly, he explains that believing in him, we see the Father and we have the power to do great works in Jesus' name. Shalom is the peace that followers of Jesus can experience. Now back there in a previous moment of interrogation, Thomas realises, or he raises the question, sorry, about how they would happen to know where to find Jesus after he's left. And he's very clear. I am the way, he says, and the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And this is core to the good news of Jesus Christ and everything that he has preached to us. Everything that's gone before in all the scriptures has been leading to this very point in history. But in the passage today, Jesus reminds this, reminds us of this fact. He reminds us of what he's been trying to teach us about fulfilling the story of reconciliation. That's what it is. It's a story of reconciliation. Everything that's been written in the law, he says, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. That's everything from the Hebrew Bible. That is the order in which the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh is written. The law, the prophets, and then the Psalms. All of this points to Jesus and what he would do to redeem mankind and to reconcile them to God as they once were before the fall and decided to go their own way. But the friends were startled and frightened. I'm quite sure that any one of us here today would feel the same way in that moment. Because we, we're no better than Israel. We're just the same. We've made the same mistakes. I mean, how on earth could a dead man appear to them in the flesh? Well, I think it's very important to remember the beginning of that question. How on earth? Because that sets it. I mean, clearly this kind of thing doesn't happen in the earthly realms, does it? The text says that they thought that he was a ghost. And immediately he asks them, why are you so affected by this? Why are you troubled? What's making you doubt? Like in John's account, Jesus shows them the wounds on his hands and feet and side and gives them the opportunity to see with their own eyes, to see and to feel for themselves what scripture has been pointing to. It's also important to understand that the account that Luke leaves us is preparing us for the next part of the story or the next volume of his writings when we learn about the power of the Holy Spirit. But for now he is explaining to us that even, through, even though Jesus has been dead, he is alive again. And with a resurrection version of his body, like the body 2.0, or whatever you want to call it. So naturally, we start to ask questions. Because this is often one of the most difficult things to get our heads around when we consider the resurrection and our Christian faith. What will happen in the end? Well, clearly Jesus is solid and real 
but he's still susceptible to humanly things like hunger. But somehow he can appear and disappear as if at will. The theologian Tom Wright, Tom's an ex uh, Bishop of Durham, extensive uh, commentator on the New Testament, New Testament professor at St Andrews University, he says that this is the hardest part of the resurrection to grasp. Even Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 takes quite some time to explain what a resurrection body will be like. Many people assume that resurrection means life after death, as in going to heaven. Well, the problem is this isn't, this is in a, 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 a first century Hebrew culture is where this is written. The Bible clearly tells us that resurrection is an embodied life in God's new world. A life after life after death. But the new body will not be the same as the one that was before in something that can be described as a new act of creation which parallels that of the original act of creation in Genesis. God will make a new kind of material, one that is no longer subject to the chaos that is death. About this Paul says, I declare to you brothers and sisters that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the, the, the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus had been teaching while he went about his ministry for three years before his death. He was sharing the good news, the gospel, the euangelion. And it's often this teaching about God's new world that can be a struggle and a challenge. But it's so important for us to understand as Christians today. Jesus explains what the scriptures had been saying, had said about him and what he would do and what was to happen next. He leaves us with very practical instructions on how we can be part of his resurrection story. Or in other words, the mission of the church. That mission is clearly stated in many places throughout the Old and New Testaments, and it's this. Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations. The Bible always saw that when God acted to fulfill all the promises to Abraham, to Moses and the prophets, then the whole world would be brought into the embrace of God's saving and healing love. Repentance and forgiveness of sins are not just a matter for the individual, it's a matter for the church. 
At the heart of being a Christian is a personal turning away from sin and celebrating God's forgiveness. We say this every Sunday in the Lord's Prayer. But the words go much wider than these walls. They have the power to literally change the world out there. We only need to look around to see dispute and conflict. It's everywhere and it's rife. We've seen so much on the news about different groups of people who want their justice or perhaps even just revenge on another person or group. And recently we've been seeing disturbing reports of conflict in Northern Ireland, which for many just bring back memories of the troubles in the last 50 years. But in each of these cases there is a common thread, and that is that nowhere in any of those cases can we assign 100% guilt or 100% innocence for that fact. We all fall short of the glory of God. Tom Wright says again that the only way forward is the one which we all find the hardest, and that is repentance and forgiveness. It will only be by the resolute application of the gospel under the Lordship of the risen Jesus, that we will move forward toward the creation of new hope and new possibility. That is truly a marvellous and praiseworthy thing. For I admit freely that this can be, or it can seem like such an impossible task. We've seen the risen Lord but fail to recognise him. But we carry on in faith, even despite all of this. Jesus promised his followers that they would be equipped with power from God to engage in their task of preaching, teaching and baptising in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit. These familiar words from the Great Commission will come to us in days to come, uh, but we will be equipped by the Holy Spirit as we reach Pentecost. But this volume of Luke's words ends as it begins. It ends in the temple. We haven't read that bit today. Go and read it when you get home, it's there. I've spoken much about the resurrection in terms of Jesus, his and our resurrection bodies, and one of the ways we perhaps misunderstand ways the ways are intended to be. The way that God has always intended them to be, as far as we can know. Now, I realise that it's now 10 to 11. I have a video to show you, and I'm going to show you it because I think it's important. So if you just give me a moment. If you could go back to the city of Jerusalem during Bible times, the biggest thing you'd see is the temple. This beautiful building was designed by King David and built by King Solomon, and they believed that it was the home of the God of the universe. Wait, I thought God's home was in heaven. Well, the whole point of this earthly temple is that it's the place that overlaps with God's heavenly home. The temple is where God lives and rules all creation as king. That's cool, but even Solomon, who built the temple, didn't believe that it could contain the God of the universe, right? Yeah, the building was just a symbol, and it pointed to the fact that all of creation is God's temple. And that's actually what the first page of the Bible, Genesis 1, is all about. Really? It says that creation is God's temple? Well, it doesn't need to say it. The whole story shows it. In Genesis 1, God creates an ordered world out of a dark wasteland by speaking in a series of seven days. Then on the seventh day, God's presence fills creation as he takes up his rest and rule. Similarly, the tabernacle and later the temple were built and dedicated in a series of seven speeches in seven days, after which the priest or king could rest and rule in God's presence. 
Ah, so all of creation is where God intends to dwell. It's like his temple. Exactly. Now, turn the page to Genesis 2 and we get another portrait of creation. This one focuses in on the land. And in the center of the land is a region called Eden, which in Hebrew means delight. And in the middle of delight, God plants a garden in which God and humanity live together. And that's why the temple was modeled after the garden, filled with imagery of gold and flowers. The menorah symbolized the tree of life. It's the place where God dwells with his people. Oh, got it. And check this out. In the temple, the Israelite priests and Levites were to work and to keep the temple in God's presence. This is exactly the job description given to humanity in the Garden of Eden. So these humans were the first priests. But instead of ruling with God, they wanted to rule on their own terms, and they're exiled from the Garden Temple. And like Adam and Eve, Israel's leaders also wanted to rule on their own terms, and they too were exiled. The temple was destroyed, and this left them wondering, did God give up on Israel? Will God bring about a new creation? Well, the biblical prophets anticipated the day when God would create a new temple with a new priesthood. That's when God's presence would fill all of creation. And when the Israelites returned to the land, they did rebuild the temple. But that temple didn't turn out the way the prophets hoped. In fact, later Israelite prophets said that this temple was hopelessly corrupt. So they're still waiting for the ultimate temple. And here we come to the story of Jesus. He said that through him, God's presence and rule was coming into our world in a new way. And he presented himself as a new kind of priest. But Jesus wasn't a priest and he didn't work in the temple. Right, Jesus said that God's presence, his rest and rule was filling the world through his own life, death and resurrection. Jesus was claiming that he was the true temple and this new temple would expand out to include all of creation. That's a really big claim. And it got even bigger. After his resurrection, Jesus said that God's presence would come to dwell in and among his followers so that they would become mini temples. Communities of people where God rests and rules. Exactly. This is the Bible's vision of the church, which is described as a temple. Not a building, but people. Yeah, like when Peter says, you all are living stones built up as a temple for God's spirit to dwell. So at the end of the story, do we ever get a new physical temple? Well, not exactly. What we see is a renewed cosmic temple, just like Genesis 1. And this new creation doesn't need a temple building because through Jesus, all creation is now the place where God rests and rules the world with his people. I've been pondering uh, on our need to pray for others lately, so let's pray together. Almighty God, your living presence in Jesus the Christ is celebrated at city gates and at marketplaces, by those in need of healing and those who are amazed in heart and mind. In moments of wonder and unexpected changes, our senses are disrupted by the extraordinary so that suddenly we see you standing in our midst, speaking words of peace and inspiring your world to discover the possibility of the kingdom of heaven in the ordinary world. Help us to enjoy our moments of wonder in a world where explanation and logic could chip away at faith May we marvel at the growing knowledge of science and the wonder it creates, from starlit skies to molecules and atoms, giving intimate knowledge of a creation so full of opportunities. Thrill us with the mystery of what we are yet to know, so that it expands our desire to notice you in unexpected ways and places. In this journey through a pandemic, we give thanks for all those who have offered signs of resurrection in their work and commitments. We pray for doctors, 
nurses and support staff who tirelessly care for those who enter their view at times with potential harm to themselves. We pray for the scientific community as it continues research and development in care and prevention. We pray for those who are the recipients of care and notice the wide range of people whose health has been affected by being unable to receive treatment and support. Help us to recognise that while the virus has world Im worldwide impact, we are not equal in immunisation programmes. Help us to notice that communities who will be the last to receive the support they need and to work towards the fairer share of wealth and resource so that your risen presence reveals the kingdom in every land. We grieve those who mourn the death of loved ones. And may we be those who share the memories and love that allows hope to rise from loss. We pray for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth and give thanks for the life of her beloved husband, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. We recognise and give thanks for the huge amount of work done by the Duke and, and in particular his passion for conservation of the natural world and for empowering and equipping our young people in their most formative years through schemes like the Duke of Edinburgh Award. We pray that these things would receive new life and energy and that many more of your good creation would receive the help and support they need. In these difficult and grief-filled days, surround Her Majesty and her family with the peace that surpasses all understanding and the assurance of your promises that come to us through our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help Her Majesty in time to fill the void left in her and grant her the chance to rest in the comfort of your love and that of her family. We pray for a revival, that people across this town and county and nation would turn to you looking for what they cannot find elsewhere. May your Holy Spirit move among us, touching the hearts of many, filling them with the desire to know and learn more about you and to reach out to your church. May we be bold and confident to share with those seekers the good news that is Jesus Christ, alive, dead and raised, and to pray for them earnestly. Lord, build your church through us, your servants. Make real here in this place the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus, our risen Lord, we pray. Amen. We'll now dedicate the offering. Out of your providing, Lord, we make this offering brought from our daily living. Sanctify your gift and bless the life from which it comes, that with a cheerful spirit and an ungrudging heart we might be devoted to your service. May we who have much help those who have little and share the love of Jesus, the good news he preaches as we do so. In his name we pray. Amen. Our final uh, hymn is 352, Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I think that we will just play the first two and the last verse.
God's chosen witnesses to testify that Christ has been raised and that we are raised with him. Do not look for him among the dead, but be glad and rejoice in his salvation. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen.